Welcome to The Old Man of the Three with J.J. Reddick and Tommy Alter, brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 160. Kevin Herter and Alex Caruso, this is the whitest episode we've ever done. That's okay. We'll acknowledge it. Get it out of the way. Two of my favorite hoopers in the NBA. Uh, Tommy, we broke down some amazing stuff about the Kings season. I thought Kevin, in particular, talking about uh, Coach Mike Brown, his two-man action with Sabonis, uh, the Warriors series, just phenomenal basketball stuff. And then with Alex, we get into a lot of the playoff stuff and as well his defensive season and some of the challenges that defenders in general face in today's NBA. First team all defense for the correspondent. Exciting exciting news for the show. Exciting news for 342, I would say. Then some hardware. Yes, we're, we're excited for Alex. Uh, congrats to him. It was weird because the whole time we were doing the interview, once we brought up the fact that uh, he was first team all defense, um, all I could think of was the movie The Program. Are you familiar with that movie? Yes. There's a scene where Latimer, I think it's Latimer, this roided out guy, the big roided out guy, he uh, finds out that he makes first team all defense. He's going to be on the starting defense team. And he goes on a long epic rant and he keeps saying, first team defense, a place at the table. And then he bashes his head into a car window. Uh, Roid rage is a real thing. Yeah, very, Alex is very, it's a great comp. <laughs> it's a great comp. Uh, we are recording this the day after game one of the Nuggets and Lakers game. Tonight is game one of the Eastern Conference Finals featuring Boston and Miami. Don't want to talk about that game. I actually want to talk about last night. Just a fantastic basketball game that we got to see. Obviously, Nuggets jumping out to a big lead early some adjustments from the Lakers, uh, any takeaways that you had from the game and watching it? Well, I thought you talked about this last night a little bit. The The second half, the Lakers' second half adjustment defensively feels like the story of the series. And whatever Mike Malone does in game two to counter that, which we will see, just right. feels like that is, but it is, it does say, you know, when we were talking about the preview before, uh, this is, a, it's a Davis Joker back and forth. And whoever between the two of them and, um, whoever, whichever coach can sort of win the adjustment battle there, it feels like is going to come out ahead. The one other thing I wanted to ask you, and I think this probably ties into, you know, some of the conversation we're about to have is just Davis offensively. Um, obviously 40 last night, his offensive rating right now is 116 in the playoffs was 114 in the regular season. He's been a, when he's been healthy, he's been a great player since he's been in the NBA, but is, are you, is there a part of you that is, um, uh, not surprised at all, but just like overly impressed with how good he's been offensively. We know how good he is defensively. I wouldn't say overly impressed. Um, there, there's there's different versions of Anthony Davis scoring to me. There's the ISO version where the Lakers really emphasize getting the ball to him, particularly on the left side in that 12 to 15 foot area. Uh, some at the top of the key, as we saw last night against Jokic, but that's kind of his bread and butter, having played against him. He likes that left side. So there's that part of it. Uh, there's the offensive rebounding part of it. Um, and then I thought last night in particular, it was a lot of just feel. He scored a lot in that short roll, pocket, uh, short jumpers, floaters. Um, there was a, a play late in the game where somebody dribbled, penetrated, and he kind of uh, you know veered off behind the defender at the rim, got a, got a bounce pass, shot a little floater. like. He's he's never been a great jumper outside jump shooter outside of the bubble, but I I just love his feel for the game. He's a, he's a smart player, credible defensive player. Um, again, we've always felt like I, at least me I've always felt like Anthony Davis is a top ten talent, and some of it is availability and the injury issues. Um, some of it is fit at times. Some of his motivation. I know. It's, it's hard to sort of carry that mantle when you're on a, a struggling team like he was at times in New Orleans. But in terms of the talent, no, I'm not surprised. The, the, guy's, a, the guy's a bucket, and, uh, and he showed that last night. One thing last night, you know, in, in just kind of going through the game today, because I, I was on get up for two hours and then first take for two hours, I, I think it, as much as this game was about the stars, as much as it was about Murray and Jokic and Anthony Davis and LeBron, Got to give some props to the role players. Uh, Michael Porter Jr., I thought, had a solid game. KCP hit big buckets in the second half. Austin Reeves was great. Roy Huchamara was great. Reeves is going to get a bag. <sighs> well, he's, he, he, somebody's going to, you know, the most any, any team can offer is four for 80, and somebody's going to offer that. And then yeah. the, the Lakers will have to make a decision about whether they want to match. But uh, he, 
deservedly so. I see these weird things where they're like, eh, is he a, how is he going to get 20 million a year? Is he a top 15, top 20 shooting guard? It's like, dude, do, do, how many good shooting guards are there? Yeah. Number one. And number two, the, the player's salaries is just going through the roof. $20 million is not what it was 10 years ago. Yeah. I get, I get that there's some sticker shock there, but the guy's worth 20 million. Just a year. watch the playoff, <laughs> just watch him play. And you can, you could understand it. I, I totally agree. I think my, my question, we've talked about this with Denver all year. Um, is the depth, you know, first it was sort of the big man depth, but overall Bruce Brown was obviously great. I should, I should have mentioned Bruce, of course. Yes. But, but the bench minutes, they, they were getting, even in the first half when they were shooting lights out, they were getting hurt when, um, when there's, when the starters were not out there. And so that does feel like a question mark is like who, if they probably need one other guy on that bench to step up. Yeah. I mean, they've, they've been pretty tight on that eight man rotation in the playoffs playing Aaron Gordon as the backup five. Um, and early, I know I, I didn't quite pay as much attention, uh, on the rotations in the second half. Obviously I was looking at matchups, you know, we will talk about the Hachimura adjustment in a second, but I, I know early when Jokic was out, Anthony Davis was out. Jokic came back in, Anthony Davis immediately subbed in, um, you know, LeBron can win those minutes by himself cause he's LeBron. Um, it, it's, it's interesting. I bemoaned, and we, we've mentioned this on the podcast, but I've bemoaned for two years just a, a horrible roster construction of the Lakers. And I've talked all season about the Celtics having such a complete roster. I've talked recently about the Nuggets having such a complete roster. And the, the Lakers are sitting here. They have a great roster. They have yeah. a bunch of really good basketball players, and it gives them some optionality. Speaking of optionality, the decision to switch Hachimura onto Jokic Nuggets were two for 10 as a team uh, with Hachimura guarding Jokic. Um, I may have mentioned this on our live last night. I think you got to move Aaron Gordon out of the fucking dunker spot. I hate the dunker spot. Get him on the wing. Um, uh, Sixers Twitter knows this. Uh, you know, having a, whether he's a shooter or non shooter, it doesn't matter to me. Having him in space where he can be a free screener on their shooters or go into dribble handoffs on their shooters. And then all of a sudden, Anthony Davis has a longer recovery to Michael Porter Jr. coming off a dribble handoff, Jamal Murray, KCP, whoever it may be. I think that's where you, you got to get him out of the way and force Anthony Davis a little bit to play the cat and mouse game in terms of the def defensive three seconds and then force him to make some tough decisions. And the other point I want to make, if I'm Michael Malone, I'm telling Eric Gordon, dude, I'm cool with you shooting six. You make zero, I'm cool with it. Like, it's on just, me. Just, I want you to shoot six threes. Just so they if they're gonna, it. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, I had one question. Yeah. I don't remember what you talked about this last night, but this was a big topic of conversation during the game. I think before the game and definitely during the game. Is the altitude thing a factor at all? Uh, yeah, I heard a lot about this on the broadcast last night because they kind of closed the pregame show with this. So I always felt... Uh, you know, you, I've never played Denver in the playoffs, but you, I always felt coming into Denver, whether it was a back-to-back -back or you had the day before, the first run in the first quarter and the first run, meaning the first five, six minutes, right? Until there's really like a longer dead ball. The first run in the first quarter, first run in the third quarter, always a little tough, but within the game, outside of those minutes, I never really uh, paid much attention to it. Um, and and you keep we keep bringing up last night. I'll say uh, we'll be doing these YouTube lives for Islands in the League. Our friends at DraftKings, obviously, uh, our presenting sponsor on Islands in the League. We'll be doing YouTube lives after eight or nine of the conference finals and finals games. Um, so we had a 15-minute one done last night. Um, we'll let you guys know on Twitter and on social when the next one is, but it will be uh, relatively soon in these conference finals. Um, Tommy, I said on first take and get up today, and I mean this, Nikola Jokic is the best basketball player in the world right now and got me curious about uh, finals MVP odds right now. So right now, as uh, I think we, we talked about earlier, um, Celtics at plus 100, Nuggets at plus 180. Those are the current NBA finals odds. So they're the two favorites. Um, and if you look at the finals MVP odds, the two favorites, naturally, Jason Tatum at plus 130, Nikola Jokic at plus 185. Then you've got Jalen Brown, LeBron, Anthony Davis, Jimmy Butler, Jamal Murray. That kind of rounds it out of people that I think realistically could potentially be the MVP of the NBA Finals. Um, it's interesting. They have two two of the top three are, are Celtics guys. Yeah, I think that Davis number looks pretty. Uh, that looks pretty looks, promising. Looks really interesting. Yeah, really. <laughs>
Um, I, I was gonna, I was gonna, I was thinking about this when when we were talking about this, this the topic today. It was Iggy the last sort of non, the last non superstar to win this win Finals MVP in 2015. Yeah, he had to have been. Yeah. So, I mean, is somebody like is somebody like Jamal? Would he be in that category? Um, diff different. It's really different because Iggy. And I'm not saying Iguodala didn't deserve the praise. I, I still think Steph, I've said this for years, I still think Steph should have won in 2015. Um, that's not to take anything away from Iguodala, but I think a lot of that was, you know, LeBron had crazy numbers. LeBron shot 39%. They inserted Iguodala in the starting lineup. That kind of changed the makeup of that series a little bit. Um, I, well, I don't even remember the exact, 15 points, 16 points. Whereas with Murray... You know, if he's if he's a Finals MVP, he's probably getting you twenty eight to thirty two points a game. Yeah. Um. So I think there's a little bit of difference there. A lot of adjustments to be made in this series. Um. The other point I wanted to make, and this is just not an, an adjustment thing. This was just my observation of the game itself. Um. And and Michael Malone touched on this uh, after the game in his presser. He talked about the transition offense not being as good in the second half. They obviously want to push the pace a little bit. I think the Lakers offense helped their defense, right? The first half, it was some some weird passes, the KCP interception at half court that led to a bucket, LeBron throwing an outlet lob to half court that was intercepted very easily. Um, that turned into opportunities. And then every time Jokic got a missed shot, he pushes the ball, he throws ahead to Aaron Gordon, he throws, throws ahead to Jamal. Um, so I, I think that's a, a cognizant thing the Lakers have to be aware of is it isn't just about getting back. It's just about running good offense where people are in a good spot to get back and not creating as many of these opportunities uh, that the Nuggets had in that first half last night. It's NBA playoffs time this week. Everyone can score a no sweat, same game parlay every day during the NBA playoffs. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app using code JJ opt in and place a same game parlay on any NBA game. If it doesn't hit, you'll get a bonus bet back up to $10 only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code JJ. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Massachusetts, call 800-327-5050 or visit gamblinghelplinema.org. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Kansas, call 1-800-522-4700 on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, Kansas. 21 and over in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gambling resources. Um, all right, let's get to our guys, uh, Kevin Herter and Alex Caruso. Uh, we appreciate it. All right, let's welcome in Kevin Herter. Kevin, first of all, I just want to thank you for agreeing to come on the podcast. There's been a little bit of animosity uh, from the Kings and myself and our podcast. And I know that, you know, I saw your IG post prior to the playoffs uh, where you highlighted a lot of the doubters about the Kings. And I, I think my quote about malpractice was included. And uh, Sabonis mm -hmm. keeps telling us no. I under Understandably, it's all good. So I do appreciate you agreeing to come on the show, man. <laughs> uh, of course. Thank you guys for uh, wanting to have me back. So I've done this a couple of times, but... I don't know, man. Well, what's the reason for that? Why do you think? Uh, why do you think there's some, some animosity? I'm, I'm unaware of the situation. Oh, you're unaware. Okay. Well, uh, just real quick, uh, not to rehash the whole thing, but basically, they traded uh, Sabonis for Tyrese Halliburton, and I referred to it as malpractice. It had nothing to do with uh, Domas. It was just strictly about what I thought, you know, in terms of Tyrese's ceiling. And at the time, too, there was uh, next to no shooting on the roster. And then you guys went out and traded for yourself, drafted Keegan Murray, uh, got Malik Monk, and you hired Mike Brown. And all of a sudden, you're a damn good basketball team. And I've admitted my wrongs. I've apologized formally to all parties. Uh, and that's it. That's it. That's, I, hey, at least we admitted we're wrong. That's, that's the biggest thing for me. I will but, uh, hey, it's, it's all, we're there. You have some, you have some good takes and some takes that sometimes we have to take back. But uh, as long as down the line, we all, we all acknowledge, hey, it's, it's great trade for both sides. It's awesome Domas is with us now. And I, yeah, totally. Onward and upward. Kevin, we've acknowledged just a bunch in this past year uh, with the fan base, the Kings fan base, how great they are. 
Um, obviously the beam. When did you start to figure it out? Like how early in the in the run were you like, okay, this is a little bit of a uh, a different breed of fan? Yeah, it was it was pretty early. Uh, the biggest thing of why Sacramento is so crazy is really because there's there's no other sports team there, and so they're they're not competing with anything. And like everybody in Sacramento, there's one thing that everybody claims: it's the Kings, and that's all you see. There's billboards everywhere. It's a small city already, but especially if a city has one team that they're really passionate about. And so 16 long seasons of, of not winning. And then all of a sudden the one team you care about is really good. Like everybody comes out and they root for you. So it was a special year. Hopefully that energy continues year after year. And, um, but that's, that's really kind of it is I, I realized it pretty early in the season. And then once we started winning and everyone realized like, wow, we actually have a, a chance to make the playoffs. Like let's, let's really get behind them. When do you think they're going to retire the beam lighting? Do you think that's just going to carry on now in perpetuity? And that's going to be a tradition? Or do you think at some point, because I, I, I've said this after you guys uh, lost, or maybe it was right before game seven, where I said, regardless of what happens in this series, Sacramento Kings are, have one of the brightest futures in the NBA, right? Young team, two all NBA guys, coach of the year, the the ancillary pieces that all fit together, all under contract. Like it, it just, the team makes a lot of sense. And I, I do think, I do think at some point we can't light the beam after regular season wins because the expectation is going to change with your team going into next season. We saw this happen a little bit with the Memphis Grizzlies over the past few seasons where all of a sudden you become a target and all of a sudden the expectation now is like conference finals, finals, championship. It, that's a good question. Uh, I'm kind of curious the same as if we're going to carry it on in the next year and the year after. Like everybody loves it. It seemed like it was something that kind of took over the NBA and was a really fun, I don't want to call it gimmick, but thing to get behind or it's a gimmick. cry. It's a gimmick. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll call it what it is, but it's a fun gimmick. It works. And it was original at least. Uh, but that's a good question. Like, I, I don't know if you guys know, it's like what, what other teams have I've had something like that across sports. Like I think someone out here said the angels, like the baseball team had one and I don't believe that they still do it. Like they put the halo into the sky. Uh, but I'm not sure if things like that stick. So I think I'm kind of with you. Like, I don't really, I don't really know how it's going to carry over. The only one that I experienced and that comes off the top of my head. Cause I, I lived it was um, the 76 er song after every win. One, yeah. two, three, four, five, sixers. Teams have that. Blah, I just blah, can't. Blah. I can't think of things. I mean, like like baseball teams will play, will do fireworks and stuff after they win, but I can't think of anything as like distinct or striking as that. It's part of what made it so good. Was it was it right. did feel like it was a, it was a pretty original idea. I, mean, I think he, I think Jason um, said right when you guys started doing it, it's like you guys need to give a raise to whoever came up with that idea because it definitely, from a marketing standpoint, it kind of accentuated uh, the hot start. I think it could be a it I think it could be a gimmick and I think it could be a little a little corny and I think it can also be awesome like all of the that's can be true. I I I guess my point more has to do with expectations going into next season beyond next season. Like you guys have put yourself in a position you battled the defending champions to a game 7, had chances a little bit and we'll get to Steph's game 7 in a little bit but had had chances to sort of close them out. And and I do think going into next season, the conversation around your team will be much different. Yeah. And it should be, you know, you get to that point, hopefully as a team, like the expectation becomes winning and maybe each individual win isn't celebrated as much like the beam. It felt like every time we won, especially at home, it was a celebration. Like, Hey, let's, this is great. Let's like the beam. Whereas moving forward, all the best teams that have, have done it year after year, and I think first thing that comes to my head, like the Milwaukee Bucks, they win and it's expected. Like they, it's you know, they shake their hands, they they walk up the court and they get ready for next game. And so at some point, yeah, you gotta you flip the script. Uh, but I think for us, it was a way to enjoy each win, uh, a way for us to interact with the fans. Like you grab the microphone after the game and uh, you put a big emphasis on, hey, we're we're now a winning team. We're not we're not the same Sacramento Kings of the past year. So we'll see. The expectation should for us change moving forward. I don't, I don't have many regrets in my career, Kevin. Um, like I certainly wish that I had re-signed with Philly after my first two years and finished my career there. Um, but then I wouldn't have gotten a chance to live in my favorite city, New Orleans. And then I wouldn't have gotten a chance to be Drew Holiday's teammate or Josh. So I don't really view anything related to my career as like a regret. Um, I do regret one thing though. 
Um, there was a couple items that I wanted to check off the box late in my career because I took, I took the game so seriously. Um, one was to wear neon shoes. Once they outlawed the sort of team wide, same colorway per game. And it was like, everybody started being a little individual, you know, you got to the Kobe Grinches or whatever. So I checked that box off my first year in New Orleans. I wore a bunch of neon shoes that year, which was pretty awesome. And then the other box I wanted to check off was wearing a headband. And uh -huh. I remember a specific game in Philadelphia uh, where Jimmy had everybody, remember the ninja headbands with like the tie uh -huh. in the back, which we can't wear anymore, but everybody was kind of rocking those. And I had agreed to do it. And at the last second, right before we went out for warmups, I took it off and I never got a chance to wear a headband. What was it like this year? Just <laughs> rocking that headband. <laughs> for some reason, it feels like guys... Guys like me and you in the league, it feels like the headband right away is, is something that you make fun of. It's it's something that I'm you not making in. fun of it. I'm maybe a little I'm bit, acknowledging your bravery. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about right away. It's like it's like wow, this is kind of this is kind of a joke. I guess the guys who have come before us didn't rock headbands enough. Uh, I was just trying to I was trying to change up my look. Like I've never like the thought behind it was I've never worn an arm sleeve and the leg sleeves you could play around with. I wear like the three quarter sleeves, but it was just something else that like nobody else, at least that was white was doing like putting on a headband <laughs> and uh, maybe wearing your hair a little bit longer. I'm trying to like play with my hair in games. I don't want to put a pound of gel in it just to keep it back. And the headband just came, just seemed to like check a lot of those boxes mm -hmm. for me. And uh, it was something different, you know, it was something different going to Sacramento, just trying something new. But um I don't know if it's going to stick around next year. I haven't gotten that far. I feel like it's now become kind of, kind of a thing. So I don't know if the fans will like uh, see you, if I got to hold on to you it. You feel like your sleeve is is your version of the headband? Hmm. Good question. Hmm. I I was always going to get a sleeve. I, I that was just something I wanted to do. It's just something I wanted to. Do. I've told this story before, but the. I, I did it in four sessions. First one was like December, then one in January, then one in February, then one in early March to kind of like <laughs> do the finishing touches or whatever. And we played um, the Cleveland Cavaliers in LA uh, at um, at Staples. It was a ABC primetime Saturday game, like a big game or whatever. And we come out for the jump ball and I'm, you know, dabbing everybody up on the Cavs or whatever, acknowledging them. And, and Kyrie looks at me and he's like, JJ, welcome to the black community. <laughs> <laughs> I had people come. Maybe me all like, I had to seat. do was wear a headband. I don't know. No, I had benches. Like I was getting in front of opposing benches, and there was players like Jeff Green. I think he was one of them. He's <laughs> like, "Come on, man, take the headband off." And like right away, I'm just like, "Jeff, come on!" Like, who else is doing this right now? You got to at least respect the grind out here. Uh, but it's like it's the fine line. You can't do too much. So if you have the headband, you can't throw on the arm sleeve or like a wrist fan, you're looking like a, my player. So mm. I feel like it's one or the other. You do the, you do the arm sleeve, you can't do the headband, but if you do the head headband, you can't do the arm sleeve. So the, it's like the last point I want to make on this, and it's a valid point. You don't want to look like a, my player, but you brought up something that's really interesting because when I played a lot of people would ask me what kind of hair product I used <laughs> that made my hair stay in place during a game, just a simple texture paste that by the way, um, but that was, it was funny because that was always a concern I had is like, not a concern because I wasn't thinking about it during the game, but before a game, I would go to the locker room and I would look in the locker and, you know, sometimes you had pullovers and especially early in my career, sometimes you had either a zip up or a button up. And I mm -hmm. was always excited when we got the button ups or the zip ups for our warm up tops. And I didn't have to do this multiple times a game because you just... You never know. You got calyx and stuff. A hair gets out of place, and all of a sudden, you're on national TV shooting clutch free throws, and you look like an idiot. You know, so this is this is true. Were you like a were you a gel right before the game, or was it gel at home before you got to the game? So you had a little bit of time for it to set in. Oh, that's a good question. I'm not a psycho, so I, I would actually shower well before the game and not. Okay, cool. <laughs> right, I would not. <laughs> work out, do my shooting and then shower and then go play a game. No, I would, I would wake up from my nap and shower. You know, I'm a blow dry guy. So I would blow dry and put, oh. put my hair, you know, the hair gel in. He's got, good, guy's, he's got good hair. This guy's, a, this guy's a professional hair guy. Cause, <laughs> cause I asked there was, if you guys remember last year, I played with Danilo Gallinari. He's with Atlanta. He had a big, like slick back Wolverine look. 
And Gallo's also a guy throughout his career, Gallo rocks different hairstyles. I think he yes. had a, he had a playoff Mohawk going, which was, he actually didn't tell us he was doing that. This is a couple years ago, the Easter conference finals run. He didn't tell us he was getting a Mohawk. And he literally walked in the facility one day with a shaved head and a Mohawk. And I was like, what did you just do, bro? You're, you're like 35. What are you doing? But then the next year he comes in with like a slick back Wolverine and he was doing it like right before the game. So he was in the locker room, like a ton of product on his hair and it was in one motion, like a, that he just, he tossed it all in and, and fixed it all up and run onto the court, uh, which I thought was, that was a, that was a game to play. Like, you know, that's a lot to figure out a couple minutes before the game. It's a lot of pressure to put on yourself in that moment. I, but, I agree. Valanchunas too. Valanchunas kind of alternates between different hairstyles. Gallo in particular, I really appreciate what he's done lately, which is just basically fuck it. And it looks like <laughs> he looks like a Beatles haircut, which is fine. Again, I like it, but it looks like mm-hmm. he gets out of the shower, does a quick blow dry and then doesn't put any product in it and doesn't really like trim around his ears at all really either. And it's just kind of there, you know, it's just hair and it's just, uh-huh. dude, you got to respect, man. Respect. Gallo. It is. It is. <laughs> um, One of a kind guy. Sep- on a separate note. <laughs> on a separate we... note. I actually didn't know <laughs> this is where <laughs> we were going to go today. <laughs> oh, can you tell us a little bit about, about Mike and his approach and why you think it, uh, why you think it broke through for you guys, just in terms of creating a culture, just going from 30 and 52 to 48 and 34. Yeah, Mike was, Mike truly is like, he really has an old school approach. I I don't know how many coaches in the NBA are still like him um, in terms of how hard they coach and how much they demand from you uh, as a team and as a player. And for me, one of the more eye-opening things at the start of the year and why I think he was able to coach so hard is how tough he was on De'Aaron. And so we would, we would be in film sessions or on the court and he held, he held Foxy to a higher standard than everybody else. And that was, that was behind closed doors. Like that was, that was in front of the team. We're watching film. He's calling him out. Uh, we're on the court. He's stopping plays. Like he demanded so much out of Fox that when he get on other guys, it was like, Hey, if he's getting on, on Foxy and Domas the same way he's getting on 13th or 14th guy, like you have no choice, but to, to listen to him, take his coaching and you, and you don't really have a response to him. And uh, so I think the best thing he did was he established that Fox allowed him to coach him as hard as he did. And then I, I just talk about like his accountability. Like we, we were a team that practiced like every day we, we had routines. Uh, it didn't matter if we won or lost. It didn't matter if we were traveling, uh, we were going to get in the gym and we were going to improve and get better. And, and Mike was going to be leading that charge. And so over the course of the year, I just feel like we, we never had any slippage. There was a standard that was set as a team uh, that we had to live up to every day. And if, if we didn't, like Mike was coaching us, it was similar to how, uh, how coaches coach in college. I feel like, and, and JJ, you would know better. Like there's, there's some coaches in the NBA that are very hands off and you get, you have your get what you need days where you can pick and choose if you want to come in and get shots up. But a lot of the team practicing stops after the first month or two into the season. And then, it's keeping your body right, keeping your head right, keeping your, your individual game right. We are a team that was practicing as a unit throughout the course of the season. Like game 82, we flew out to Denver in a game that didn't mean anything. And, and we showed up from flying in and we practiced at four o'clock and then played Denver the next day at 11 a.m. And uh, that was just, and there was really no surprises. Like it wasn't, oh, game 82, maybe we'll see if Mike takes it off. Like we all knew what was going on. And so Mike was just, he was, I wouldn't even say tough on us, but he was just, he set a standard and he didn't let it slip all year. I, what's interesting about your response to Tommy's question, because I think it's a great question, is accountability gets thrown around with coaching a lot. Um, certainly we can talk about X's and O's and basketball strategy and in-game adjustment and all that stuff is really, really important. Um, if you're not holding your players account, uh, accountable, I think to some degree, and I, again, I lived it as a player, to some degree, you lose a little bit of trust, you lose a little bit of credibility, um, and that, especially over time, can deteriorate the culture of the team. So establishing that accountability early is so important. On the flip side of that, it's on sort of the players to accept that, accept that style of coaching which I, I don't think is is the easiest thing in the world, especially when it, you're not used to it. How did Fox, how did De'Aaron sort of respond to that early in the season? 
Not at his head. I think there was definitely respect both ways. There's respect as of all us players of who the players in the past Mike had coached and the teams that he had coached. Uh, Mike has coached LeBron. He's he's coached Kobe. He's coached Steph Curry. And uh, in our locker room, no one is no one is at that level yet uh, for what those guys have accomplished on the court to to have any other sort of response to him. So Fox was he you know he never looked a certain way, never sucked his teeth. It was like he he took it, uh, nodded his head, was in agreement most of the time, and continued to play. Um, let's talk about this the basketball side of that real quick because you guys had one of the best offenses in NBA history. Um, it was very free flowing. There was a lot of movement. There was a lot of space for uh, Domas and De'Aaron to operate. Um, when you're playing in that sort of environment and system, uh, night to night, just the enjoyment level, how would you sort of describe that part of it? Because uh, the reason I ask that is because I've played sort of in, in, I played in every sort of offensive system there was. And for me, I was at times, hey, go stand in the corner, guy. And then at other times when you're sort of involving everybody in the action and it's a little more unpredictable, there's a, there's a joy and like a love of playing that way. There was, there was a lot of trust in our offense and um, it was so free flowing that, you know, I feel like as, you know, as players, we didn't have to press. There wasn't, you knew your touches were going to come as long as you kept moving and as long as you kept playing the right way. And uh, you know, the guy who set the tone for us with that was Domas. A lot of what we did went through him, and he just played super unselfish. But I think the rest of our offense, uh, we didn't have to hunt shots. Like, you didn't have to expect that this touch and this possession had to go up because I might not see it again. I might be, like you said, standing in the corner for four or five possessions, get a grenade, and have to sh- take a shot. So uh, there's a lot of trust in our offense that is, as long as you continue to, to move and play, you can give yourself up on cuts, allow the next guy to come get it. And, um, you know, at some point the ball was going to find you. And the other element, like for how fast we played, it was something that we drilled was, was playing fast, getting the ball out, even after makes, was getting the ball out and trying to beat the other team down the court. And uh, that's always a fun offense to play. And when you're, when you're getting up and down, when you're trying to play super fast, uh, playing in transition, and then the rest of our offense is if we can't get in transition, all right, we're, we're into our next action. We're running, we're sprinting off screens, we're cutting back door. We're, you know, there, there's so many layers to what we do. It was a lot of fun. And um, I said, again, a lot of that started with Domas, just his unselfishness, and it just trickled down to everybody else. We mentioned this statistic on – the Tim Legler episode back in March, I believe this was the the regular season episode that we did with him um, in the half court in terms of most efficient actions in the second spectrum era over the last 10 seasons. Uh, there were the, the top five. It was uh, a Nikola Jokic post up this season, uh, three seasons of James Harden ISOs in Houston and a, Sabonis Herder DHL, <laughs> like top five. And when I played with Joe, right, the two man action we had with the DHO and, and some with Ben too, but it didn't just happen. Like there was an organic evolution to figuring each other out and how to play together. What was the origin and sort of the, the foundation for that action specifically with Domas? Yeah. I mean, well, first of all, what's funny is I didn't know that's that until you said it on the pod and I had probably 10 plus people send it to me the same morning. Like, yo, did you know this? Uh, so that was how I found out. But second, you're right. Like it wasn't something that we had a set play that was, Hey, Kevin run off Domas and take this shot. It all happened organically. And it was something that you could kind of see how offensive possessions were developing. And a lot of them came in transition. Um, but for me, it it was kind of, it was getting to that action before defenses really knew what was happening. Like we could be running back in transition. Domas is dribbling the ball down the court. And my defender is, you know, looking back, trying to get transition, point guys out, get everybody set. And before he knows it, like I'm already sprinting off, coming to get the ball. And um, I had the freedom to do that, which was great. Our offense allowed it. And Domas also was looking around, trying to get guys the ball, especially in transition. And you know, rarely would he take a one-on-one. But there was something that we kind of just learned over the course of the year playing with each other and uh, where we could get into those, um, how we could keep it where defenses couldn't take it away. And 
that was something that Golden State did great in, in the playoffs is in the half court, they did a really good job of, of trying to take away that action that a lot of that had to come in transition. And it was, I was finding in transition, like I said, before the defense could get set, before they really figured out what was happening, uh, I was already spreading off screens. And um, a lot of that is pace playing in the half court, uh, being comfortable playing at a sprint instead of a jog. And, uh, you know, it's, I'm glad I got a good screener and somebody who <laughs> gives good handoffs on the other side. Um, we were taught growing up uh, to get away from each other. When you first learn basketball, everybody wants to jumble together and you you taught just the basics of spacing or whatever. Um, you're not really taught to chase the basketball. And Kyle, for me, was the guy that I watched. He was one of the first guys that would chase the basketball, especially as you're talking about in transition, where defenders jogging back, trying to load to the basketball, and then Kyle's gone, right? Before you can get body contact, which is what Golden State tried to do and did really well uh, in the half court against you guys. And Kyle, Kyle was sort of the first guy that, uh, that I saw do that and I tried to emulate. With respect to Golden State, what do you think they did well in the half court against that action? Yeah, they did. I mean, they were, it felt like that was the main action that they were trying to take away. And that was both my DHO and Keegan's DHO. And they, they put Looney down the court. Uh, they put him in the paint and they were giving up back cuts. Like we got back cuts really throughout the course of the whole series. And we were running into Looney for the most part. And uh, there's not a lot of teams that play like that in the NBA. One of the few in Milwaukee plays like that. Philly would play with that and just put Joel in the paint. But Lakers, they were sorry to interrupt, but Lakers also, that's what they did early on in that Golden State series. You know, there's a million different screenshots you can look at from game one before they really started going into a lot of Steph Curry high pick and roll action. It was just LeBron and Anthony Davis in the middle of the lane, as you're saying, talking about Looney, and then just sort of funneling the back cuts into a big. Yeah. And so that's really what they did. And so there was like at all costs, they were trying to stick to our body. And it was like, we're not going to let you get over the top of these screens. Everything is going to be pushed down the court. And, uh, you know, the pace of the playoffs is always slower. So we weren't able to get out and transition the way we had in the regular season. And, and a lot of ways loosen up their defense. Um, and so a lot of what we did came in the half court, just like a lot of what they did came in the half court. And um, it's just tougher to get going. You know, we get into door step plays. It's tougher to play with the same pace, especially when you add physicality and, uh, you know, the game is called differently as it should in the playoffs. So they did a good job of, of taking away that action and, and making us try to go to other things. I wanted to ask you about box in the clutch, both in the regular season and then also in the playoffs. Um, what do you think makes a, a clutch scorer like him, you know, so effective at it? Supreme confidence, I think, first and foremost. And then the ability to get to any shot. Uh, Fox is someone It's funny, and, and I kind of noticed this in the preseason. He, uh, you know, his aggressiveness increases as the game goes on. Like, he really kind of starts games, and he, he's feeling it out. He's getting other guys involved. He's uh, not taking the same shots that he does and a lot of times in the second half. and um, But then you got to have players that are special that can get to those shots. And not every team has one. So when you do have one, it's it's special. And for us, it's Fox. Like It, it feels like at any moment, no matter who's guarding him, if it's a one-on-one situation, like he can get to a makeable shot for him. And this year, it was he was knocking him down. And he was knocking him down at a high clip. But you know, he, just, he has the necessary wiggle. He has the dribble moves and the shot-making ability to – to not only get to any shot, but but make it at a high percentage. I have a take, and I've maybe said this before. I really believe the shot against Orlando, and just the ridiculous of that sequence to get to the point where he had to make that shot, but that sort of set the tone for the entire season, not just for your team, but for him. It was early in the year. Um, you know, I, I even though you guys, you know, were had a decent start. It wasn't like people were taking you seriously. And it's just like, it's amazing to me how one moment can sort of create momentum and confidence for a team, for a player. And I look back at the season and I'm like, that shot is one of the most important shots across the league this season. It was. And that really got us going. Like we, we, had a, we started the season 0 and 4. I think that was a road trip. That was right after like my non-call at Golden State. Clay fouls me. You did not get fouled. You did not get fouled. 
This guy. That was that. That uh, was your natural shooting motion. Are we serious right now? <laughs> I don't. I can't tell. I can't tell. We're being. No, I'm just Wait. trolling you. I'm just trolling. Okay, you. there we go. Okay. Um, so then the following was the Miami game. I think Hero might have shuffled his feet a little bit for three. And then like the following game was Orlando. And Orlando at that point was not supposed to be a playoff team. They ended up not being a playoff team. And we were going to lose that game. And then Fox went crazy and then hit that shot to win. And then we started to win after that. I think we went on like a seven or eight game winning streak shortly after once we got back home to the West Coast. But it was like that was that was such a confidence builder. I think for him, like really established that alpha dog mentality for a winning team. Like, hey, if we're if we're trying to turn this around, like you're our alpha, especially at the end of games um, where he wasn't taking a back seat to anybody. You know, we trusted him with the ball to give him at the end of games to go get wins. But that kind of that flipped the script for us. That was like, we weren't supposed to win that game. We just stole that. And now let's, now let's go on a run. Like, let's see what we can do. What, what's going through your head, speaking of alphas, with Steph in game seven? Yeah, I mean, that was unbelievable. Uh, like, I, I look back on it, too. And I don't want to, like, put myself in his head, like, what he was thinking going to that game. But, like, he took 38 shots in that game. And it was basically like, if we're going to lose this, I need to have an all time bad shooting night. Like if, if Steph Curry takes 38 shots at the percentage that he usually shoots at, like he's going to get anywhere from 40 to 60 to 70 points, like depending on how well he shoots and for him to take 38 shots and end up with 20 to 30, like he'd have to shoot crazy lower or for him a really bad percentage. So his mentality in that game was often just like, man, I'm like, I'm not going to let my team lose. And, um, you know, he had a, he saw a first couple going early. What we were trying to do is, is obviously just make everything tough and be super physical to start the game just so we could try to keep him out of his rhythm or his flow just because when he sees a couple go down, it's just snowballs and, and you can't stop him and he gets to everything and uh, he can score at any level that it just felt like in that game he was he was going to try to to will his team to victory and it, it didn't matter how many shots it took to get there. I said after that game that Steph – more so than I, more so than any player that I played against, Kobe would be the only other guy. Um, has the ability to break your spirit. When he goes on a run, it is demoralizing. Was that accurate? Did, it, was that an accurate description of Game Seven? Did you feel that? Did your team feel that? Uh I would say not in that specific game. Even though I, I agree with what you're saying. In the fourth quarter, I think what broke our spirit, like as they continued to make shots and tough shots, we weren't making the ones that we were used to making. We were turning the ball over. And so it was like that. We wanted it so bad, especially in that fourth quarter, trying to make a run, like not shooting well. And, and all right, at some point, we're going to see one go down, get a turnover and get ourselves in a mini run. It just never happened. And then Steph on the flip side was was giving us 50. And so I wouldn't say our spirit broke until we knew, I think when Mike took us out and was like, like, all right, at the end of the game, they just put in our subs and, and that was it. But that was a focus of ours going into the series was the runs that they're capable of going on, uh, how those guys can just rattle off and, and add clay to that bunch. Like when Steph gets going, it feels like clay always has a three mixed in in there too. And Jordan pulls the ability to do it at times. But for us, it was not letting him get to that point. And so I talked about earlier how we, we always used to practice taking the ball to the net and going off of makes. Like that was a big emphasis for us going to the series, especially playing on the road was, if they make a three, like we need to beat them. We need to score a layup at the other end every time they make a three because they're going to make one. They're going to celebrate. They're you know going to point to the crowd. And if, if we can be, if we can lay the ball in that, like that'll break their spirit. And uh, Golden State's just, they are. They're known to do that, especially Steph. When they go on those runs, they're impossible to stop. Kevin, I'm assuming you saw Giannis's comments after they lost the Miami Heat about failure. Correct? I did. Your perspective on that, given that I believe that uh, failure, success, whatever the perception is, is directly tied to expectations. When you look back upon this season and you had arguably your best year, if not one of your best years in the NBA, Fox has all NBA, Sabonis has all NBA, Keegan's uh, all all rookie, uh, you know, Mike Brown, coach of the year. I'm probably forgetting an award that one of you guys won, but you you didn't make it out of the first round yet you had a great season 
you battled the defending champs. It took an all-time performance from Steph. How do you how do you summarize the season? How do you view the season now that you've had a little bit of time? Yeah, I think the situations are different, and uh, I respect Giannis just because I haven't I haven't been in his shoes. That guy's got a ring behind him. I think it's different a situation for them as uh, a team that's won a championship. That core has been together for years, and being the number one seed and what I thought was the best team in the NBA all year. Uh, losing like that in the first round, I think, is is a different situation to us. Uh, obviously, our our first year together as a team, everything's so brand new um, as a team and an organization. Like everything, being in the playoffs just felt brand new. So there was a lot of new things for us that I think everybody on the outside, especially our fans, were just happy with us being in the playoffs. So the expectation was getting there, and everything else was going to be gravy. But you know, interior on on you know on the team side, the player side, like obviously we had, we had higher goals. Like we thought we were the better team that series. We thought, you know, we had the makings to, to put together a run and, and win a couple rounds and try to do something special this year. And, and we didn't. Um, but I think for us, it's easier to flip the script or flip the page and look forward to next year. Just thinking like, all right, if, if we did this in year one, let's see what we can do in year two and year three and year four is, is our chemistry continues to build and, and we get older and we get better as players that, um, it's a different situation than, than Milwaukee, but uh, I don't want to relate to Giannis. I'm, I'm sure he has a different perspective on a lot of things in the NBA. Um, but I think sometimes is, you know, they definitely had more expectations and uh, than we would have as uh, given the situations. No, I, I think that's perfectly said. And to be clear, I'm, I view your season, not being a part of it as a fan of basketball. I view your season as a, as a, as a success. And just like I view the Knicks season as a, as a success. But again, the situation changes, right? If you had said, Hey, Knicks, they're 10 and 13 back in December. And all of a sudden they're the fifth seed. They're one of the best teams in the NBA over the last three and a half, four months. They get out of the first round. Oh, that's a success, right? That, that was not expected. Uh, but then you're playing the eight seed and you lose in six games. Your offense sort of sputters, like now you're disappointed. It's just the range of emotions in sports day to day, week to week, season right. to season. I, I think that's what makes it so beautiful. Um, but to your point, which you articulated so well, it is all directly tied to expectation and uh, the circumstance of, 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 of a loss. Right. And even like you, you look at it, Giannis is arguably the best player in the league on the best team. And um Losing to the eight seed, it's it's not like it's in the NCAA tournament where, all right, we had one game. This team played really well and beat us. Like you get beat one time on one night, that happens to everybody. But it's also kind of different now in the NBA. It's, it's a series, and and a lot of times a better team wins over the course of seven games. And so that was, I think, the most surprising and um, why I think there's there's definitely some pushback on what he said. But again, his perspective is different for most guys in the NBA. Do you feel like your perspective on a personal level? Um... I wouldn't say it's more advanced than your teammates, but you went through a version of this with the Hawks already. So you've been, that was a team that I don't think anybody really expected to make a run like you did. Um, and even though you guys didn't, you know, win a championship that year, it was still, that was objectively a successful season. And so this is now your second time going through this. Do you feel like you've learned lessons from that? 100%. And that was almost like the, the start of our downfall was the run that we went on. We won before we were expected to win or before we should have won, let's call it. And, uh, you know, that run, I think we were, we were the five seed beating Philly as the number one seed. Um, we, our fans didn't expect us to get that point. The NBA didn't expect us to. And that just put a fast forward on our timeline. And, and our, I don't think our team as a whole was fully at that point. And so then we went into the next season with a similar roster. And if every year we're trying to build and get better, uh, we were first round exit, so it's not like we would have built from uh, a first series win. But the expectations of that team just went through the roof the next year because we made a conference finals, and it was our right, conference finals or finals or bust. And maybe as a unit, like that wasn't that wasn't where we were there yet. You talk about like skipping steps. I would say that team skipped a step, and we overachieved for that year, and we won on a great run. That uh, ultimately, two years later, all these expectations that had happened everyone thought like, all right, we got to make a lot of changes because now we're failing as a team when in reality, we might not have you know, consistently built to that point anyway. And I think we were getting there, we were building it just, it never it came to fruition. So 
that might have been the same here with SAC. Like if we won our first round series, we beat the defending champs and we go into the next series, we're playing uh LeBron and the Lakers and you know, who knows what happens in that series. All of a sudden we go into next year and it's all right, the Kings should be a two seed, one seed and in, in East in Western Conference finals or bust and the expectations the expectations uh they change. So I think you gotta hopefully you stay on the right path. You try to build every year, you try to get better every year, but that's what happens when you win is uh from from the outside looking in, everybody all of a sudden looks at you differently. Kevin, I, I don't think anybody could say it any better than that. I think that's perfectly articulated. Um, we appreciate the time. Uh, listen, you've got an open invite. I know you're you got a place in New York. You have an open invite to come out uh, to the Hamptons this summer. Let's get some work in the gym and let's play uh, 36 holes a day. All right, is that a yeah, deal? Let's that do deal? that. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. <laughs> Sign me up. All right, good deal. We appreciate the time, brother. The chase for the NBA title is in full swing. While the best in the NBA battle it out, you can get all the playoff action at your fingertips with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers can make a $5 bet and score $150 in bonus bets instantly. Plus, everyone can score a no-sweat same-game parlay every day during the NBA playoffs. Open the DraftKings Sportsbook app, opt in, and place the same-game parlay on any NBA game. If your bet loses, we'll give you a bonus bet back in the amount of your initial bet up to $10. My two conference finals favorites as of right now, the Celtics and Nuggets, currently have the best odds to make the NBA Finals. Celtics at plus 100, Nuggets at plus 180. Download the app now and sign up with code JJ. New customers can make a $5 bet and score $150 in bonus bets instantly. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code JJ. Love the convenience of getting what you want right to your door? With DoorDash Grocery Delivery, you can stock up for the week or order last-minute cravings conveniently. With thousands of grocery stores to choose from, you'll find the best in your neighborhood and boost your local economy with each and every order. You'll get exactly what you ordered or we'll make it right. So sit back and enjoy quality groceries just like you picked them yourself. Want even more value? You can save on all your grocery and restaurant favorites with a $0 delivery fee on all eligible orders with a Dash Pass membership. You guys know that I'm busy, whether it's this podcast, first take, or calling games. I don't have a lot of time to grocery shop or even make myself food. That's why I love DoorDash. Get 50% off your first DoorDash order up to a $10 value when you use code OLDMAN at checkout. Limited time offer, terms apply. That's 50% off up to $10 on a $15 minimum subtotal and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter code OLDMAN. Don't forget, that's code OLDMAN for 50% off your first order with DoorDash. All right, let's welcome in one of the OG correspondents, Alex Caruso. Alex, I understand that uh, you've been golfing recently. Is that true? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> I feel like I kind of want to start a podcast with you that's just a golfing podcast. We could do well. Where we talk be great, about... Well, I'm an ex-athlete, but we talk about athletes that um, get into golf while they're playing and the troubles and tribulations of being really good at one sport and trying to be good at another sport. Because golf, okay. I feel, feel like, is the, the equalizer and everything. Yeah, well, it's that it's that chase for perfection. You know, like athletes, like we, you know, or at least in basketball, you know, you, you make a mistake, you get 10, 15 seconds, you get to make up for it. Golf, you have a bad shot, you know, wait a couple minutes, go up there and try and focus again and hit it. And it's just one of the most frustrating things in the world when you can't figure it out. But then those days you do figure it out, it's like euphoria, right? It's like the polar opposites. Alex, I saw you tweeted something about, there's been a lot of buzz, a lot of buzz about uh, the four conference finals teams being the same as the conference finals team in, oh, yeah. in the bu bubble in 2020. I know you posted something the other day. Um, and I don't know why this doesn't get talked about more, but when we talk about uh, the asterisk, asterisk conversation around the NBA, uh, no one really talks about 2021, which to me was the most fucked up season in NBA history. I'll just say that having lived yeah. it. Um, the, the bubble itself though, I, I, I think we've talked about this before, but I think it's important to bring up again. Um, because it, to me it was, it was the opposite of a fluke. Like I was there six weeks 
I mean, and it was fun initially, and I couldn't wait to be there. You guys all stayed an extra two months. I know Paul George has talked about just the mental, um, the mental trials of being in that place for so long. Um, and obviously, you were playing for something. But what was it like? The mental aspect of that, uh, of everything that was happening across the country, uh, being isolated, uh, and then also trying to play high level basketball and win a championship. Yeah, it was like the ultimate you know, uh, compartmentalizing, you know, from one thing to the next, uh, cause you know, some days it'd be like real chill or I'd, you know, we don't have practice or anything. I go play 18 holes and come back get some lunch, uh, watch some film and just hang on the room. And then some days it's like, you know, impromptu league meeting, you know, where I, all the teams are in the ballroom and we're trying to figure out if we're still playing or not. Uh, and then you mix in, you know, actually chasing after a trophy and, you know, the, the emotional toll that that takes on the game by game of the stress and you know, the, the, even the positive energy that goes into it. Uh, it, man, it's just, it was a long three, three and a half months <laughs> to say the least. Um, but you know, I mean, I think, you know, for me winning the championship makes it worth it. I think if, if you don't, if we didn't win it, it, it wouldn't have been worth it just because it was so much, man. It was, it was so much. And, you know, it's hard to hard to put into words and kind of perspective. Just you know, it was basically like college, but no fun. You know, besides <laughs> me playing golf, you just like we're sitting in a hotel room. It's basically like a dorm room. You you go there, wake up every morning, you get scanned, make sure you're healthy. You go to your team meeting, your practice, you go back to your room, or you're playing a game. So like, it, it was it was just it was a lot of different angles of uh, you know mental strain, emotional strain, physical strain that, you know, it's hard to, hard to explain if you weren't there. Besides you not being there, what do you feel like the key difference in this Denver Lakers series is based compared to then? I love how you phrase that. Yeah. Um, Big besides. <laughs> I, I think, I think the series kind of comes down to how AD plays. I think, I think him being able to handle Joker. Cause when we played them, you know, obviously it was a handful of years ago, but when we played them, we had, JaVale, Dwight, and AD to throw at him. You know, that's that's a lot for um, for one guy to deal with just because it's kind of three different looks. And that kind of freed up AD to, to score on offense. So I feel like for him, uh, defensively, I, I kind of want to see – I kind of want to see how that's going to work because, you know, as you – JJ, I saw the clip you, you talked about the other day with uh, Tim Legler about how the Lakers were playing defense where they were just basically just funneling everything to the paint and – you know, trying to make the Warriors play inside the three. And it's like, that, that's, I don't think you can do that exact same thing against Denver just because I feel like they're a little more balanced and they obviously have, you know, five weapons that can kind of stretch the floor and play. So it's going to be interesting just, you know, tacticiously, just, just seeing how each team comes out in game one, you know, kind of seeing what the first punch is. Yeah. I, I also, to me, AD is the most important player in this series, period, no matter who you're rooting for or who you think is going to win because of his impact, potential impact on both ends of the floor. Um, And with LeBron, you know, again, I said this a couple of times, but he's clearly uh, hobbled. He's also 38 years old in year 20. Um, Aaron Gordon has been fantastic in the playoffs. And if you look over the last 10 years uh, in the half court, LeBron's lowest effective field goal percentage against any player is against Aaron Gordon. Um, So Anthony Davis has got to score. And the other point I want to make about uh, Anthony Davis is he goes back to their own pick and roll game, LeBron off the ball, Austin Reeves, D'Angelo Russell, Schroeder, whoever it may be, Jokic likes to be up. He's not in a drop. And Mm -hmm. how they get Anthony Davis the ball on the backside, it's not just the one-on-one stuff against Jokic, but how they get get him the ball on the backside against... Jokic's coverage like that is interesting to me as well and then on the other end obviously guarding one-on-one my question for you actually is about the pick and roll or the dribble handoff action with Jamal and Jokic because that's been a a, a big part of their play and it's so tough to guard and I just don't know if you can play it for a four five six seven game series whatever ends up being just running steady, steady drop coverage, but then you don't want Jokic getting behind Anthony Davis and making plays. How would you 
defend that? Do you, do you think there's an answer for the best way? There's no great answer, but the best way to defend yeah. Jokic and Murray. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think you get in trouble whenever you give guys multiple options, right? Like if you, if you have a great score and you give them, you give them the paint and you give them free throws and you get them, you know, five threes, then it's going to be a long night. But for Jokic, I think it's different. I think it's, you either have to commit to making him a passer or commit to making him a score, right? You can't have both. Like if he ends up getting 20, 25 and then has eight, nine, 10 assists, like that's, that's too many points accounted for with the, with the way the rest of the roster shoots. For me, if I, if I had to make a decision, I, I would almost just make Jokic trying to beat me scoring, you know, make him score 30, 40, whatever he's got to do and, and try to take away everybody else. But you know, obviously that's easier said than done. And that's kind of the big question is who else on the Lakers can guard him or at least match up with him other than AD, right? And can AD go night in, night out? It takes it takes a lot of effort defensively to, you know, to be focused and the physical toll of, of making sure you're physical with Joker, Joker so he can't just, you know, walk and do whatever he likes to do and then try to go on offense and provide, you know, what he has to provide for them to win. That That's going to be the big thing for me, but yeah, I think if I had a choice, man, I think I'd I'd try to just make him make him a score. Um, I, I think he almost gets some rhythm off the passing too. You know, yeah. how some guys get to the free throw line to get their shot going. I think when he can get, you know, a couple back doors or some of those over the top late passes, uh, that kind of finds his rhythm, and then from there he, he kind of goes into scoring. I, I so I agree with you. I agree with you that you do have to sell out to one or the other. I think Jokic is good enough to still do both when you sell out. And I oh, go, going back to that Phoenix series, you know, they're playing they're playing him one on one with Aiton when he gets the ball in the post. We go back to, you know, game four, he had fifty three points. He also had eleven assists. Then we get to the to to game five and game six, where he had twenty nine and thirty two. He had a triple double those games. Like it, it, you're you're not going to limit him to ten points, and you're not going to limit him to you know fifty points and two assists. Like he, and you brought up something that I think is important to note. You talk about the two man game. We can talk about the ISO stuff, but how they use him as a passer out of delay action, that's going to lead to guys getting buckets. Like they're they're just so good with their cutting, their rip screens. You know, for Aaron Gordon, where now all of a sudden he's he's posting up Dennis Schroeder in the middle of the paint, like. They just do enough stuff that it's yeah. really hard to just completely sell out one way or another. I do agree with what you're saying, but I think it's no, yeah, hard I mean, to sell out one way or another. Imperfect, imperfect answer. Like, yes. right. No, no, yeah. MVP arguably could have won it again this year, you know, depending on wh- where he was in the season. If he would have just tried a little harder towards the middle of the <laughs> end, once everybody started making a big deal about it, kind of turned him off a bit. But yeah, I mean, he, he's, he's showing in the playoffs, like he's almost at that point now. You know, when, when guys are so good for so long that they don't really care about, I don't say he doesn't care, but like they're focused and they're going to put their best performances in the postseason. And it's one of those things, like you said, like there's, there's no right answer. Like you're going to do everything you're supposed to do some games and you're still going to lose because he's going to get, you know, 32, eight, nine on a, on the night you did your job. Right. And then the, the nights you don't do your job, he's, he's going to do whatever he wants. So I think the way that they have their team set up where, you know, KCP shooting the ball so well, Michael Porter Jr. just shoots it every time he touches it and he's six, nine and he can get it off. And like you said, I think Aaron Gordon is, is a big, is a big chess piece in this of his, his ability to kind of stalemate or at least be super physical with Braun and kind of take him out. And just, it puts a lot on the shoulders of those other guys for LA. Um, I'm, I'm really just excited to watch the series and I think it's going to be really good basketball. We've we've talked a bunch about KCP, your former teammate, um, and just his impact so far. Is there on either team? Is there like a sort of unsung guy that you were to make a prediction you feel like it's going to have an impact that maybe people aren't thinking about? Mm. For Denver, I could see, I could see, I could see like a Braun or Jeff Green having having a good series just for what they can do. I think defensively, um, Jeff might might get some minutes on. Uh, on Braun if, if Aaron Gordon gets in foul trouble some games and then Braun just kind of, you know, does a little bit of everything and he plays hard. He kind of plays within himself. Um, for LA, I, dude, I really think it, I really think it's gonna, it's gonna have to be, you know, 
it's going to have to be one of Vando, Reeves, and Schroeder. Um, I think one of them is going to have to play really big for them to have, you know, a legit chance of winning this thing. Just because uh, you kind of know, you kind of know AD and Braun are going to do what they do. Uh, D'Angelo has played really well in the postseason. I think he's going to be pretty consistent. Um, I, I really don't know for LA who's going to be that 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 extra guy. It's been Reeves for the most part, you know, th- throughout the season. Um, but man, does actually I'm going to change my Denver pick. My Denver pick's going to be Bruce Brown. I think he's going to have a really good series. I like the Bruce Brown pick. Um, yeah, I, forgot, I do I think I do think it's Christian Brown and not Christian Braun. By the way, I just wanted to point. Oh, out. is it really? Oh, yeah. that's my bad. <laughs> it's all good. It's all I know good. who he is at least. Next, no, I don't know. <laughs> you are next time you guys, next worked. time you play against the Nuggets, like, yeah, next time guy. you play against the Nuggets, he's gonna be pissed. He's gonna be pissed. Yeah, like, um, why don't like here, here's so I like the Schroeder call. I like the Schroeder call for the Lakers. Um, I'm thinking about who's actually gonna guard. Jamal Murray, the bulk yeah. of the minutes, and whether he starts or not, uh, or whether they start Vando, um, I think Schroeder ends up playing a big role in this series. And maybe you know, he, again, he guarded Steph at times, especially late in that series. Uh, maybe he's the guy, you know, going. Maybe it's not game one, but throughout this series where he's matched up a lot with Jamal Murray, I think he's going to play a big role. You know, the, the thing about that though I, I don't love that matchup for Dennis because Jamal Murray can go play in the post. post yes, I know he's so comfortable. I know bump bump one one foot kind of dirt fade away, and he shoots him at a. I want to say shoots him at a fairly decent clip. That's just I feel like that's I feel like that's the counter if they go to that that I don't love. But yeah, I, I know what you're saying. No, no, no. Dennis so a, so he look campaign whether it's campaign or Shamit, he was more than comfortable in that Phoenix series going to the post, made some shots. Totally agree with you. Um. I guess where I go back to is going back to his movement stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. D'Angelo, not great chasing. Um, yeah. Reeves. He'll be in his pocket. Reeves sure. will probably be on him at, at times. Um, I, I, I don't know. You could go Vando and maybe even switch at times, I guess, if you're comfortable I, with I thought with about AD. that matchup when I was going yeah. through the, the role players in my head, and I was like, all right, Jokic AD, Gordon there. The problem is, who do you put? You know, who do you put Michael Porter Jr. on? Yeah, because because if Van, if yeah, because if Van is there, I don't know who where where that matchup goes with one of the other other guards. But I do like the idea of that. What about what about Rui for the Lakers? That that could be. I mean, that's another body you could at least throw at at, jo- at Jokish, but um. I think I think Rui Rui wins the matchup on offense against just about everybody, you know, maybe besides Jokic and Gordon, for the most part. Yeah, uh, he's been man. He's he's had like I don't know what he did when he got to L.A., but he's been having like a revelation there. He's been playing so well, and he wasn't playing like that in Washington. Like he was playing well in Washington, um, but but he's been playing really good for them, and and that's kind of been you know that's kind of been L.A.'s thing for the last two months, you know, is the, the, the parody of the team, you know, everyone's kind of having their night or having their week and, and it's kind of just carrying them the, the, I don't know. Cause, cause like you said, AD and Braun once every couple of days, they're, they're a little beat up because guys are putting so much attention on them. These, these other guys have kind of, you know, kept, kept the ship afloat when yeah. they've needed to. It's like a lot of people have said, Alex, this year's Lakers team is probably LeBron James's best supporting cast. <laughs> <laughs> many, yeah, many people. Have you didn't that. have to do that. You didn't have to. Do uh, that. I want to we'll talk. See. About- we'll see. Right? We'll I'm just kidding. We'll talk about it. I- Check back in three weeks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I yeah. want to. I wanted to ask you about the the Miami Heat. Uh, you guys were winning. You're winning in the fourth quarter of that playing game. Uh, what, yeah. what is, you could have thrown me a softball from the lead into this. I know, but I, th- what is, what has been going through your mind for the last month? Uh, whether, yeah, whether I, it has I, been just about a wasted opportunity or whether it has been like, Oh fuck, like we were wrong about the heat. I mean, to be fair, the heat, the heat, you know, from that fourth quarter moving on, they've been a different team than they were all season. You know, they, they, they didn't play like that during the regular season when we beat them on opening night. And then when we beat them late in the year at our place, um, but they, they flipped a switch and did something. 
Yeah, dude, that, that playing game hurts, uh, especially because I thought I played pretty well, and it, it always hurts more when you lose and you play well. Um, but I, I just we, – we didn't make any shots in the fourth, and then we just gave up too many pain points. And then Jimmy's just a master, at, you know, kind of getting to the stuff that he gets to. Uh, I mean, definitely, definitely missed opportunity. Uh, if I'm being candid with you, I thought the – I thought the Raptors game was going to be the more difficult game for us to win. Just the first one, we never play well in Toronto. Um, and then moving from that, I had a lot of confidence, obviously. You could tell how I played in the next game. Um, but, yeah, it just, just came up short. You know, it was one of those years for us, too, where that was kind of like – that was kind of our MO. Like, we were just a little up and down. Uh, and we just – you know, we were, we were down at the wrong time. Alex. Uh made all defense this year. What did that first team? I, I, I'm well aware because I voted you first team, buddy. I should, yeah, I should have said that. that. You made first team well, on defense, Alex. Congratulations. There's a difference, right? you know, there's a difference. You know, what's funny. I, 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 I'm going to be honest with you. When I was doing the voting, there was some consternation about a couple picks. Uh, really first team, all, all defense guard was like the easiest thing for me. It was like, I'm going to put Alex and Drew. And don't really have to think twice. It really is like the only guy I, I it's like I love Derek White, and I had to give him some thought. But I was very yeah, comfortable. With, I was very comfortable with those two picks. What did what did that uh, recognition award? What did that What did that mean to you um, as someone who takes so much pride uh, defensively? Yeah, it was really cool. Um, I think it kind of hit me in waves. You know, when it first happened, like I almost towards the end of the year, I almost kind of expected it to happen just because I thought I had a really good year. And like you said, I didn't really think many guys were as consistent as me and, and had the type of year defensively, you know, uh, that I did. And plus just I guard everybody's best player. Um, and, and then, you know, I kind of went into like, all right, friends and family celebrating. And then I started thinking about, I was like, dude, I watched some of my old clips from when I was on two way in LA. And I was like, this guy went from that, to making first team all defense, I was like, that's that's a hell of a hell of an accomplishment. Just you know, continuing to try and get better and continue just to, to you know be true to myself and compete and play hard. Um, it was really cool. You know, I thought I had a really good defensive year last year, um, and I just missed I missed so many games with you know the wrist and then a couple other nagging injuries that I thought I played at a pretty high level and maybe could have gotten on one last year had I had I qualified. So. Um, there's always something that's in the back of my mind. Like, do I think I could do it? And then just tried to focus on the process of showing up each night and doing my job. And you know, it worked out really well. What, what did you notice about those clips when you were uh, a two way guy in the G? I just I, like, there's a difference in, in, you know, my ability to keep, keep, keep up with guys, um, to understand the game, you know, understand concepts of how different guys play. Uh, Honestly, just just the mental knowledge, and then I think physically, I've just I've gotten gotten stronger. Um, probably allowed me to be a little tougher too, since I am a little stronger. Uh, and then just big emphasis on the mental side of the game. You know, understanding the game, understanding what guys like to do, tendencies, play calls, um, and then just being super competitive and competing every play. You you led the league in deflections uh, per thirty six minutes. How would you just like how would you describe to somebody listening at home uh, what makes somebody good at that particular stat? Is it all? I think I think it's a lot to do with anticipation. Um, a lot of a lot of what I just talked about about understanding how guys like to play, reading body language on the court, feeling the flow of the game. You know, you can you can kind of you can kind of figure out on defense if you're in the right position to start with like when the play is going to be dead, you know, when there's no advantage for this guy, it's like, all right, he's probably going to pass it here. Um, and so just being ready for that, you know, having, you know, six years of reps now, I'm starting to see it. I'm starting to understand where it's going to be. Um, I know, I know certain guys moves. It's, it's a lot of the same stuff I just talked about, just understanding time and place. Uh, and then just being instinctual, you know, I've always kind of had that knack for, for playing passing lanes. Um, I think this year is probably, one of my better years on the ball, getting steals and deflections, but you know, off the ball, just just having that knack, that, that that awareness and, and having the knack for being in the right place at the right time. I've had coaches talk about coaches porn before. 
and Alex uh, fits the bill for some like it's coaches porn. No, I mean that seriously because like if you watch Alex play, uh, deflection off the ball, he's at the nail, exactly where he's supposed to be. And the thing he's talking about, right, is like I'm reading body language. I know this guy's actually driving towards the middle to pass, and he times getting out in the passing lane perfectly. Deflection, right? In a two v two pick and roll, he is so good instinctually at veering back at the exact moment that the guy's trying to throw that pocket pass deflection. Like it, some of it is all the things he's talking about. And some is just like a natural innate ability, which I think is, you know, coach's point, you know where to be, you, you but then you have that, to, then you that. have to have, then you have to have the instincts to, to, to actually make a play. No. I always knew yeah. where the fuck to be. I didn't have the <laughs> instincts. <laughs> Yeah, you're gonna have some instincts and the capability. Back to your point of, of the beer and the positioning, that just it just clicked in my head. I probably need to give recognition to uh, Frank Vogel and Mark Dagnall because Mark was with me my first year when I played in the G League, and we just did so many fundamentals defensively, stick hand, shell drill, like all that stuff. Um, we charted it, you know, and we charted it, made sure we were above like a certain percentage in games and stuff, and that kind of started me there. And then getting to Frank playing the pick and rolls where you're playing veers, where you're playing, you know, reading the point guard of, is he going out for the shot? Continue to try and pursue. If not peel off. Like, I think, like you said, I've just been, I've just been adding stuff to my game defensively, just like anybody would do offensively, you know, just like you can add a, a mid range pull up or playing off two feet and playing off pivots in the paint on offense. I think for me, defensively, I've taken stuff over the years that, you know, great defensive minded coaches have had, um, and just, like I said, kept building on it and then mixing that with, you know, some natural talent that I have to be able to know where the ball is going. Um, after the first round, actually, I think it was the, literally the, the first day of the playoffs, um, after John Morant fell, hurt his wrist, Giannis fell, hurt his uh, tailbone, there was a lot of buzz about uh, abolishing the charge, they specifically uh, the help side defender. Well, they- and, um, you know, you, you get charges on the ball. Uh, but another one of your, you know, where you're at the top of the league lead. I know you've been the last two years as charges taken, charges drawn, whatever. Um, I want to get your thoughts on that, on on specifically this the secondary defender, the help defender coming in to take a charge on, you know, somebody dive into the hoop or someone who blows past their man. Yeah, I think it's just it's a combination of you know the game's just played at such a high speed and everyone, I mean throughout the league is just so skilled and athletic for the most part. Um, but, you know, I think, I think a handful of times, you know, guys might get put in bad positions when they're in the air, just because guys are taking charges are probably a little late, you know, like, I don't know how many charges I've ever taken where someone's been up in the air and, and you know, I'm going to knock on wood because obviously you don't want that to ever happen, but like all the time, anytime I take them, it's just in the chest. The guy usually doesn't even leave the ground or if he does, he's like falling on top of me. It's not like he's up in the air. It's, I don't, know, I don't even know the word to describe it, to talk about taking the charge. If they take the charge out of the game, then they might as well just like have a shooting contest every night. I what agree are you with supposed you. to do? Yes. Like there are, the rules are already skewed for the offensive guys. Like if you're just taking out principal rules of the game, it just, it's just, like I understand there was some uproar. It's unlucky that multiple guys in multiple nights kind of got injured on the same kind of play. Um, but I feel like that's such a, it's such a small sample size, like the percentage of times that guys take charges and it's positive and nobody gets hurt and you just take the ball out and go the other way is probably much higher. Yeah. I, I, I posited that maybe we should just move the restricted area a little further out. I think that would solve uh, the one-offs that you're talking about. The one thing that I'd like to get, get removed from ever being called an offensive foul is uh, specifically big guys when they run the floor and then a guard just steps in front of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, They're yeah. turning to look back at the basketball and they just run I've someone taken, over. I fucking hate time. that play so much. You've done it. You've done it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I don't, I, I, I've, I've sacrificed that one out of my game the last couple of years just because, you know, I, I'm trying to save some, uh, some physical ability for the end of the year and, and play a couple more years of my career. But I definitely, I took one, I think the first one I took in the league, I remember it was on a, it was on Michael Beasley and he was on the Knicks and I was playing on two way and he was just, 
he was just running back, looking at the guy dribbling up, and I just stepped in at the elbow and just ran me over and went down the other way. That one's – yeah, that one's a bad – that one's a bad uh, – if the ref calls it a charge, it's probably a bad call. Did you feel unethical when you did that? No, I felt great because it was a positive play. I was trying to make it to the NBA. <laughs> whatever it takes. <laughs> yeah, whatever it takes, dude. Uh, well, that's that. You could, yeah. I mean, that's your mindset. That's how we're on the same you've page, been as though. successful don't, as don't you've been. That. That's one you stay away from. Yeah, but we're on the same page. We're on the same page here. I like it. How how would you approach hypothetically if you were uh, on, in Miami right now? How would you approach a guy like Tatum defensively? Man, I don't know how many times. I don't, I also wonder if guys watch film. You know, like if anybody knows, like if if Jason Tatum has the ball in his left hand, there's probably a ninety five percent shot or chance that he's going to shoot it. Like he, every time after time, he would come off and he would either jab step and just shoot it, or he'd come off as he left left hand and do his little step back or just rise up and shoot it. And it just, it was blowing me away that nobody, nobody knew that he was going to shoot it. I was like, y'all are playing two feet below the line. The dude's got 30 already. Um, Sorry. That was me going off on a tangent about watching the playoffs from home. Uh, Yeah. If you're Miami, I think you just crowd them. You got to take, like we said earlier with with the Joker thing, you got to take, you got to take something away. You know, you can't give them, you can't give him threes. You can't give him eight, nine, ten attempts from three, eight to ten free throws, and then be able to get to the rim too. You know, I think he had a dunk early in the game. Um, got to really just was playing so comfortable. You have to be physical. That's that's part of the that's part of the thing with all these guys on offense, at least from my perspective. If you let them hang dribble, tween tween, you know, tween behind, it's just basically they're working out. They're just having a summer workout on the court. Those are the times in the games during the year, like usually middle of the year where body starts getting a little tired and I have to remind myself to kind of climb up into guys to get them off rhythm. Um, that That's, you know, that that's probably the only thing I can think of because, I mean, he can go right, he can go left, he can play off the post. Um, he's going to score. You know, you, you just have to try and – I think I would try and take away the threes over the top. Yeah, I mean – PJ not being there probably hurts Miami to a degree. Yeah. Um, Caleb, of course, will guard him some. I wonder how much Jimmy will guard him. I think that'd be a fascinating matchup to see. But I agree with you. I think the, the I think the the comfort thing is big. It goes back to like certain players. I don't understand why you ever play drop coverage against them. I'm like no, that's that's their comfort zone. That's Man. they're gonna. They're, this is what they're gonna do. They're gonna either snake. They dribble, work on that for three they, months. Yeah, summer. exactly. Like I'm watching Austin Reeves play against drop coverage, and I'm like, what do you think Phil Handy and have have been doing every day for the last six months? I'm like this guy's lost, this guy's gonna kill you in drop coverage. Make him uncomfortable. I, you you got to live with whatever the consequence of being up in the pick and roll or potentially switching. Like I, I the comfort thing is so important this time of year. I'm glad you touched on that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a big thing too, is like throwing different coverages at guys, throwing different looks at guys, just because, you know, the same thing with, like you said, you, you let them get a rhythm offensively one-on-one, but if you give them the same look all night, they're going to figure it out. Eventually they're going to figure out what move I can get to. Okay. He's going to play off. I'm going to come off, get to the post, get the switch and now go one-on-one or something like that. Like you, you got to blitz them every now and then you might even, you might even throw it back and hedge once or twice um plan the drop be up to touch like you, you got to switch it up on guys that are elite scorers like you can't keep throwing the same thing at them alex now that you're first team all defense guy i wanted to ask this year who your toughest cover was toughest cover i i think it's probably between i think it was probably donovan mitchell or d book I think those guys just like they have. I think they're they're three level scorers. They're strong. They shoot the ball well from three, and they're just kind of unpredictable. You know, there are certain guys that play in the league that have tendencies and have, you know, have certain spots that they like to get to and certain spots that they almost never shoot shots. Those guys shoot it from three, shoot it off the dribble from three, play at the rim, play to get fouls, play in the mid range, play off pivots like. They were they were two of the guys that I think probably were the hardest to guard. Donovan Mitchell and Devin Booker, according to Alex Caruso, have the deepest bags in the NBA. 
Um, That's okay. <laughs> You're the worst. Lock it in. <laughs> That's what you just said. Clutch That's, points. Clutch I'm not points disagreeing. Tomorrow. They've got deep bags. I don't know why. Like you just. Uh, before yeah, we let you man. go, uh, one last question: the Roback question. Reminder to our viewers that you can use code old on Roback.com for twenty percent off your first purchase. That's R H O B A C K dot com old. Uh, my question for you is: what golf courses, what golf trips specifically, do you have lined up this off season? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I'm actually, I'm going to Cabo here shortly, um, in the next week or so. And I'm playing, uh, Quivira one that has the really cool hole on the side of the cliff. I'm really excited to play that one. Um, and then honestly, the one I've been trying to get done for the last couple of years that I don't know if it can be this year or next year, hopefully this year, but trying to go over to, uh, trying to go across, across the pond and play, um, play a bunch of just play a bunch of golf in, in, in Scotland or in England and then go to catch some soccer games over there too. But that's that that one's probably far fetched. The the Quivira one in, in Mexico is definitely set up. And then talked about playing Payne's Valley and talked about playing uh sawgrass, but those are those are kind of just brainstorming ideas. Okay. All right. I mean all good great courses. Uh as you guys know, huge fan of Roback. Uh Roback.com uh with code old Alex will be sending you some gear. Um, I just want to let you know, by the way, there may be a spot for you. There's a trip to England to go to a Premier League game, Royal St. George's, both Sunningdale courses, and then a fourth course, uh, September 15th to the 20th. It may be too close to camp. I'm just saying there may be a spot for you. That's all. Oh, yeah, we'll talk. All right. <laughs> all right, man. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it, guys.